as promised last week, um, we have Paul Greenhouse, who's the Research and Ethics Director for the Faculty of Engineering and Environment, who's coming to talk to you about that very topic, about research and ethics, which is very important because it's part of what you need to do as uh, far as your proposal handing is concerned, of which I have news <laughs> for Chalmers and SESI students and I'll talk to you after Paul has done his um, presentation. Um, this will be on Blackboard, the presentation, so you don't need to write down what's on the slides, but you will need to take notes potentially. Um, and so it's over to Paul. Mm, thank, thank you very much, Michelle. Good morning, everyone. Lovely to be here. I was just reflecting um, in terms of, of your programme, and uh, I've been at the university for over 20 years, and the very first year that I arrived here, I, I'm a surveyor by professional training. So I came, having practiced as a surveyor and qualified as a surveyor, I came into the university and um, I taught in my very first year of lecturing on the final year of the very first year of building management, which then became the programs that you and other students are studying around project management, building design management. In fact, I taught a certain Alan Osborne, would you believe? <laughs> he was in the final year of that year, and I taught him. Um, and I remember helping him with his final year project, I think it was. You don't even call him Paul. No. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I was worried about doing my hair specially this morning for the video, but I, I didn't bother. Well, okay, yes, Michelle correctly titled me, I'm Research Ethics Director for the Faculty. Um, it's one of those difficult jobs because you're trying to persuade people to do the right thing, but they don't always realise that they need to do it. So we, we have mixed practice. Some people are very aware and attuned to ethics, and other people are probably blind to it. Um, so I'm making sure you understand the message, and as Michelle said, it's something you must do. I think you can't progress on to your dissertation if you don't complete a certain bit of paperwork. So there's some bureaucracy at the front end but I hope that you will understand that it's for a good purpose. It's not just because I like bits of paper, because I don't particularly like bits of paper. So this is really just a primer, okay? just an introduction to you. As Michelle said, this presentation, without the cartoons, um, is available, will be made available to you on the e-learning portal. Um, and there's lots more information. I'm going to give you some web links. There's a web page. There's documents. Okay, but Generally, I think the advice is that if you listen carefully to what Michelle says, what I say, and you look at the guidance, you'll be fine. You, know, you don't have to get overly um, anxious about it. That just demonstrates that you do have to be aware that if you take a photograph of someone, other than friends and family, you need their permission. We have students over in um, fashion and design across on, in City Campus East. And being creative people, they like taking photographs of interesting people. So I might like your glasses and I might like your watch. Can I just take a... F we can't just take a photograph of your glasses or even your watch. I mean, you say it's your face, but even if it's your wrist and your watch, you still need like, some sort of consent there. Yeah, because people might not be happy with you snapping away. And then we know in terms of this, this new world we live in, the new paradigm where everything can be published in the public domain globally. Yeah. So you have an initial submission, and as I understand it, you complete a research ethics registration and approval form. It does two things. Registers your project, and you're applying, you're seeking approval. And it will be approved, signed off by the module tutor, I understand, or well, Michelle. Um, but first of all, you must categorise it. And I'll talk a bit more about how you categorise research in terms of an ethics risk um, profile. And typically, it will be approved. I can hardly think of a single project that hasn't been approved, but often it's with conditions. So the, the, the approval is conditional, that you must do certain things or you must not do certain things. So, these are the essentials. Be 
before you commence your dissertation or indeed any research project, um, you must submit this form, and that applies to everyone in the university. It's not just students, not just master students. It's all my undergraduate students doing a dissertation. It's all the staff. It's all the PhD students. If you're doing a research project, you must register. And ignore that bit in brackets. Um, your pro forma is slightly different, but you can't approve it. Um, so you. Yeah, your dissertation proposal, which Michelle is receiving, ignore the traffic light pro form, that's the pro form we use, which is the same thing. It's a research proposal. This is what I'm going to do, this is how I'm going to do it, these are the methods I'm going to use, and these may be the, uh, this is the population I'm sampling. You identify all of that in your proposal as best you can at an early stage, because Michelle cannot understand your research without you explaining that. And part of that, approval process of yes you can go ahead with this project, it's a good idea, is having the ethics registration submitted. So in fact you'll have two bits of paper, two, two forms, yeah? one is the ethics forms, one is the proposal form, they, they work together and you can't progress your research project without the ethics bit, okay, so they go in tandem. So what you need to do is identify the risk category for your project, and we have a ethical scrutiny and risk assessment tool. Now, I'll see if this links through. It should do to the university website. And this tool has been around about ten years, operating in the, in the university. And it's not perfect, but it's the model we use. I found things being quite slow, but if you persevere. I do find it odd when you're in the university, linking to a university web page. It's saying that the web page is not, not secure. <laughs> okay. So th there's the tool. You, you can access that through that link. And it just explains the three levels of risk. And you just take it through there. Okay. I'm, I'm not going to say a lot more about that document because it's there. It's available to you. Um, and the form that you submit... You've got to sign it. You've got to say, this is my registration of my project for ethics approval. Um, and we, depending on the risk category, those at the back probably can't see. I guess you did choose to sit at the back. You could have been sitting down here. Um, depending on the risk category, that dictates who can approve your project. So if it's a green project, it would usually be approved by your supervisor. Now, at the moment, you don't have supervisors yet, as I understand it, so the default would be Michelle. If it's an amber project, it, it must be approved by one independent person, not your supervisor, which, given that you haven't got supervisors yet, I think Michelle is independent, is she not? Say yes, everyone, yes. She, Michelle, at the moment, is independent. She will supervise some of you. That's later on. Okay. If it's a red, I doubt whether there'll be any reds, but it's possible then it's got to go to my committee, and two of us will review it. So green is very much light touch, amber is an independent person, and red, it gets full considered scrutiny by two members of a committee. I will just explain that a little bit more in a moment. So, in some circumstances, it might be necessary to conduct a risk assessment as well. So you need to think carefully about the activity that you're going to pursue in your research, are there risks for you? Are there risks for the researched? Are there risks for the participants? And I would expect there's a few of you probably might need to complete a risk assessment. And that comes under health and safety, which is a different regime. But it connects into the research ethics registration because if your research identifies undue, unreasonable, excessive risks for you or the researched, then we won't give you approval. It's too dangerous. So we have had examples where students wanted to go back to their country of origin, which was actually in civil war, and they wanted to start asking questions 
about where the money for rebuilding some of the cities had gone. So all this American money had gone in and disappeared, and they wanted to ask people, where's the money gone? And we thought, hmm, could be a bit dangerous. You could end up dead in a ditch. So we said, we're not prepared to approve that. So, you know, the, and I know this, we, at the time, Michelle understands the conditions for this. Someone's saying, I'm going back home. I'm going back to my hometown. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is you're asking people questions that may provoke a response. And in a fairly lawless country, yeah, we couldn't be confident of the researchers' own safety and the safety of the people they're asking the questions of. So that was a no, but that's rare. So the copies of the form, when it's signed and approved, you keep a copy, you keep the master copy, because that's you've registered and you get an approval back. So if anyone says to you, have you got ethics approval, you'll go, yeah, there it is, I've got it. Okay. Michelle will also keep a copy and the programme administrator, so we've got a backup record, because every year we conduct an audit, and it's usually fairly random sampling of student projects, so in any given year we might have 1,200 student projects in the faculty, and we just sample across all departments, so we need that paper trail. And it's very important, and this is perhaps one of the most important parts, not so much the, the bureaucracy at the front end is what you do when you're doing your research that you conduct it ethically and that means adhering to the conditions that might be how you record interviews that you get their consent to the participants and that could be written consent, could be verbal consent you might be consenting through some email exchange you might offer them anonymity and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as well the consent forms which there is a copy of, I've seen a copy that you use for your programme, um, those must be submitted with an evidence file. So when you hand your dissertation in, if you've offered people anonymity, there should be no names in the appendices or in the actual body of your dissertation. But in the evidence file, it's all the other stuff, I call it, the other things, the other items, you have gathered together for the purposes of your research project. And you put those in a file, and that would include the participant consent forms. It would identify who the participants are. It might be um, interview transcripts, handwritten notes, models. It could all, all sorts of things in that file. Okay, and that accompanies your dissertation. Um, partly it's because we need these evidence files for when we do an audit. Because when we audit a project, we'll look at the approval form and say, yeah, okay, anonymity is offered, participants will be... Um, offered uh, a chance to consent or not, and, and if they consented there will be a form. Where are the forms? And that's why we need the evidence file to look in. It's also useful because sometimes, I'm sure none of you would even think about doing this because you're very ethical, but sometimes students make stuff up. So in the evidence file I had this one student where there were 40 questionnaires. I thought, that's pretty good, given that three weeks ago they hadn't done any primary research. So in the three weeks between when I'd seen them last and hand in, they had managed to carry out a questionnaire survey and get 40 people to respond. So I thought, oh, I've read the dissertation, I thought, oh, I'll go and look in the evidence file. Looked in the evidence file, pulled out the, the questionnaires, started looking through them. Handwriting is all the same. Even the colour of the pen the same. And it was like, how stupid was this person to think that that was going to fool anyone? And basically they just falsified the whole lot. Sometimes it's interviews. I've interviewed these six people. And sometimes, when we doubt it, we phone these people up and say, were you interviewed by this person two months ago? And they'll go, never heard of him. Don't know who he is. So it's partly us making sure there hasn't been academic misconduct through falsification of data. So a random sample, I'm not really trying to scare you by the way, uh, a random sample is audited on an annual basis. So this is an easy guide. Now I know those of you at the back, possibly with poor eyesight, won't be able to read this slide. I'm aware that you won't be able to read all the words. But this is a model that is based on a, a, a page that sits in our faculty research ethics procedure. And I've adapted it, I've just adjusted it to fit your world. So you can look at this on the slide. If you want to print out one slide of this presentation, print this slide out. 
So it just basically goes through stage one research design, which is where you are now, I think, at the moment. There's the ethical scrutiny risk assessment going through the risk. Submission for registration, approval, as green, amber, red. Conducting the research, which I think is the most important bit, is what you do. And then recording, submitting evidence. So you've got these six stages. Okay. So that's a slide that's worth printing out, and it can guide you through the process. Okay, I'm just going to now explore some ethical issues, because I've gone through a rather procedural approach to this, and I'd like to... Did you have a question? Yes, please. Uh, what if your research completely changes? Do you have to resubmit... Good, good question. Very good question. Um, I'll just... I know you can't have seen this, I'm not sure... Stage six, recording, submitting, participating, consensual, and other documents. Now, above that, you've got stage five, conducting the research project and project amendment. So we do have a project amendment form, because you're right. You might submit a proposal, um, and actually the feedback you get on your proposal suggests it's not a bright idea. I had one of my students in the, about three years ago said, I want to do my dissertation on money laundering. Okay, and I, I just thought I'd, I'd let him have a go at it. I said, okay, how, how do you think you could pursue that. How, how are you going to research it? Well, I'm going to go and interview um, real estate investors uh, um, and agents and de developers and ask them about money laundering. Okay. What are you going to ask them? Well, I'm going to ask them if they launder money. Seriously, do you think, and, and eventually you go, oh no, maybe it isn't a good idea, I, I perhaps need to change. So some people come up with inappropriate ideas. He was only an undergraduate, I grant you, but um, so yes, if you do change, or, or just because when you do your proposal, you think actually, I'm not going to enjoy this. You've got to live with your project, this you know the research project for the next six months, and you think, oh, I'm going to be bored to death by this. You might want to change it, and there is a form. Yeah, good question. Thinking ahead. So the essentials. First of all, does your research involve human participants? Can I just have a show of hand? Put your hand up if you think. The research that you might do will involve human participants. Most of you. I'm not surprised at all, because that's the nature of our subject. I know there's technology and there's finance investment and appraisal, and but on the whole it's about people. And, and the same for my students. Will you inform them about the research? You want to go like, yes, of course we will. It would be unethical not to inform them, unless maybe you're doing a particular peculiar, obscure piece of research where, by the research knowing they were being researched, they might behave differently. So it's often ethnographic research, yeah, where you're sort of undercover. Don't think you need to do that. You know, might be looking at the behaviour of prisoners, and if they know they're being watched, they might behave differently than the way they would behave when they're not being observed. But generally speaking, we will inform the participants, yes, Paul, we will. Will you obtain their consent using the standard consent form or similar? Yes, we will. Yeah, we will record the consent on the form. Is there any deception involved? I hope not. Because that would be unethical, wouldn't it? Yeah? <coughs> Takes you a while to work that image out. I, first time I saw it, <laughs> what's funny about Oh, we've got it now. I can see the little man. Um, do any of the participants constitute a vulnerable group? You will then ask me, well, what is a vulnerable group, Paul? Generally speaking, we're talking about young people, children, people with medical conditions, particularly learning conditions. Yeah, they might have mental conditions, which mean they're not capable of giving <coughs> informed consent. Okay, it might be the very elderly, the infirm. It might be people, you know, you could say maybe an asylum seeker is feeling in a vulnerable position. Uh, maybe they're an illegal immigrant. You're looking at, you know, the behaviour of illegal immigrants or the employment of those people in the construction industry. Those people might feel quite vulnerable and be vulnerable. Yeah? So you've got to think about that. I mean, generally speaking, I think most of you won't, won't be involving vulnerable people. There is a definition... Um, and there's a link to the definition through the faculty webpage. If the participants are vulnerable, that has implications, and I'll, I'll talk about that soon. 
Will the research involve commercially, personally, politically sensitive information? That's a difficult one. Personally sensitive information, we have a Data Protection Act in this country, that, and, and actually there's a European level agreement, so there's pretty much a standardisation across Europe in relation to personally sensitive information. Now, that, some people think, oh, it's someone's name and address. Well, no, that's not personally sensitive information. It's your medical records. It's your financial records. Yeah, that's personally sensitive. Most people's name and address and telephone number is in the public domain anyway. So just knowing someone's name or knowing which firm they work for isn't personally sensitive. But if you're looking for more, then you could bump into that. Um, politically sensitive, it's, it's a very much a judgment there. Um, because what is politically sensitive to one person is a joke to someone else, maybe. You know, there's plenty of comedians making a lot of money out of what you say politically insensitive comment on the on the television. Um, I'm not sure they're necessarily getting any research or ethics clearance for that. Commercially sensitive is the one I think you're most likely to bump into. And my students do at times. Come in, come and join us. So this is where you're talking to someone. It might be you're doing a case study of a particular company and you're looking into their practice. And as part of that, you're asking them to explain how they do business, their business model. Yeah. Can you see that becoming straying into the territory of commercial sensitivity and you've got to be a little bit careful there there are some instances where we've had students who've done work based projects and I, know, I understand some of you will be doing your research in your place of work and that creates other issues because you're not at arm's length and people might say something to you because you're a colleague they might not know that would then get represented in a piece of research so you've got to be careful on the basis on which you talk to people, they understand. I'm talking to you about my research project. I'm not talking to you about work. That's different. You've got to separate them. Um, but we have had situations where the company has agreed to the student conducting the research on the condition that the dissertation will not go into the public domain at all. It will only be read by the first marker which is the supervisor, normally I don't know about you, a second marker, and possibly an external examiner. And that's as far as it will go. It won't be in the collection in the hub upstairs. That collection in the hub upstairs is one I've put together based on dissertations from undergraduates and mainly master's students. Um, the sort of dissertation research I've just described to you would not be up on that shelf. It wouldn't be in the library. It wouldn't be shared as an electronic copy to other students. So we can make it off limits. We can do that. Yeah. So you might have to have a conversation there. Is this research likely to call any significant environmental impacts? I doubt it. Um, interesting. Our uh, faculty, in our faculty, our, our associate dean of research, he's a glaciologist, and he, every year he goes to Antarctica for about two months and he blows up bits of the Antarctic. So I, I'd imagine he has to fill in a research ethics form, say, yes, there is an environmental impact of what I'm doing, because he's trying to get at, under the Arctic ice sheet, there's water, and he's trying to get, this water has been trapped under there for hundreds of thousands of years, and by analysing the water, you can look at what the climate was like 100,000 years ago, <coughs> yeah? but to get at it, you've got to basically blow up bits of Antarctica. So, there's issues there. He goes out usually with the British Antarctic Survey and sometimes with the Americans. Last year, he was, when I saw him come back, he, he comes back from Antarctica and he has to stop off. He usually goes by on military planes and they stop off. I'm trying to think of the islands in the middle of the South Atlantic. They stop off, at, which is halfway. Is it Ascension Island? Something like that. Coming back. So he, and then he walks into work and it's like a bit of a shock having been in this wilderness. And, he, and I said, how, how, you, how did it go? How was it, the research trip go? And he said, at that point, in, the, in one point in their research, they were the deepest, most southerly people on the planet. They were the research team that had gone furthest in to the Antarctic ice sheet, furthest into the South Pole. So he said, <coughs> at, at that point in time, they were the most southerly people on the planet. I mean, that's pretty impressive, isn't it? 
Are there likely to be any risks for you and the participants? I've said about risk assessment. If you think there are, you should complete a risk assessment. In our uh, Department of Geography, all the students, regardless of the project, complete a risk <coughs> assessment. They do a risk assessment and the research ethics form side by side. Even if they identify that actually there are very low, trivial risks. But they all do it as standard. Now, we're not like that. We require self-declaration. So you must identify if you think there are significant risks for you or the research. So if yes to any of those questions, and we've already said yes, 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 and then a few maybes, um, <coughs> what steps have you identified to, to deal with those issues? And you must come up with that in your research methodology, and you must articulate some of that in the form. So these are the risk categories. I've gone through them already. I've identified them. I just want to go through them in a bit more depth. So if your research involves vulnerable participants, particularly sensitive data, risks to you or the research or National Health Service, yeah, generally speaking, it's red. And you would always err on the side of caution. If, if you think its <coughs> research project could be amber, but it's at the top end of the range, and it might, might just be red, you put it in as red. It's better to put it as red and say, no, it's not a red, it's an amber, which I've done recently. It's better to do that than it go through as an amber when actually it should be a red. But amber would be that, that you have human participants, which most of you have already put your hand up and said, yeah. So you can know what most of you are going to be. You're all pretty much all going to be amber. And then that there may be some other issues. So if it involves human participants, it must be an amber at least. And then green, that's if you're using black and white, grey, literature. So if you think if you're a historian, or you work in English, or you're a lawyer, you tend to use documents. You tend not to go out and talk to people. If you're a historian, you can't, they're dead. Yeah? If you're looking at documents. So it's green. If you're in a, in a lab carrying out experiments, yeah? not on people or animals, or yeah? We're just doing chemistry or physics experiments, that would be green. Okay? I think nearly all of you will be amber. So I've already got the link to the risk assessment tool. I think you know what most of them are in the built environment domain. There are three outcomes of registration. One is ethical approval is given without conditions. That's generally for green projects. Yeah? Yes, it's green. Go ahead. Ethical approval is given with conditions. And ethical approval is not forthcoming. So you're not given permission or consent. I'm almost certain you will be in that one. But unless you're doing a green project, you're going to be amber, possibly red. And I imagine you will be approved by Michelle or a another person but it will be with conditions. So, these are the sorts of conditions I would expect Michelle and anyone else who's approving AMBER projects as the one independent reviewer to impose. Information to be provided to part participants. That might actually mean writing an information sheet. It's like a briefing. Yeah, maybe some of you have participated in research and the the researcher will give you a sheet and say, would you just read this so you understand who I am, what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, and where this is going to end up? Yeah? You also need to use the participant consent form, which there is a copy of, uh, which will be made available to you. So you basically give the form to the person and say, will you please, if you agree to this, sign it. And you just collect them in. The, the data must be stored securely and destroyed securely. That's in accordance with university guidelines, but also with the Data Protection Act or its equivalent. Okay, so we do have law, which means that some data, particularly personally sensitive data, must be held securely and destroyed at the end of the project. And for all research projects, you only keep the data for as long as you need it. So if you've gathered data in order to write a dissertation which you've submitted for assessment, yeah? 
that data is redundant now, unless you're planning to publish a paper off the back of your dissertation, which could happen. And I, I publish papers with dissertation students when they've done a really good bit of research. 